Controllers, go, no, go for landing. Retro. Go. Lido. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Contract right. Throughout okay, history, stop. whenever Point new territories have been discovered, the question of who owns them and what laws apply is raised. Well, out of space is no exception, but who owns and regulates space and why are space laws necessary? It started in 1957 with the first launch of Sputnik, uh, shortly followed by uh, the first launch in 58 of the United States. At that time we were in the Cold War, in the middle of the Cold War, and there was a danger that space would be used for military purposes. At the time, East and West were separated by an Iron Curtain, which wasn't only a physical frontier, but also symbolic of the differences and rivalry of opposing ideologies. There was a, a competition between the Russians, the Soviet Union and the United States. And no one knew who would be the first on the moon, for example. So therefore, they both agreed that there should be no sovereignty rights in outer space. And outer space should belong to mankind, to everybody. From then, it was decided that space law should exist. In 1967, the Outer Space Treaty, ratified by the UN, fundamentally recognized that space belonged to everyone. And in 1969, the US took the lead in the space race with the success of Kennedy's Apollo mission to the moon. The United States have put their flag there, but at the same time, there was a special act a law in the United States specifying the purpose of this flag, saying that this is only a question of pride, but not a sign of sovereignty. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Since the end of the Cold War, space exploration has totally changed. And while the original treaty of 1967 has received four additional conventions, there are many areas where present regulation is ambiguous. For example, in the case of industrial exploitation of minerals from asteroids. We could uh, imagine that some asteroids would be brought into uh, a low orbit of the Earth and then exploit it in one way or another. But the question there is, uh, can we qualify an asteroid as a celestial body? If it's a celestial body, then it falls under the Outer Space Treaty. If it's not a celestial body, then you can argue it's not under the Outer Space Treaty. And in such case, uh, exploitation maybe could be, could be open. This ambiguity further extends to telecommunications and deep space exploration. Today, there are plans to return to the moon, and in the next 10 to 15 years, any future moon stations will be highly dependent on telecommunications to maintain contact with the Earth. At the moment, regulating this technology falls to the International Union of Telecommunications. If several nations want to go to the moon independently, uh, the United States, Japan, Russia, China, Europe, this means that five different signals will be sent to the moon and come back. Now, and this all within a certain very limited frequency band. If there is no agreement and coordination before, it could well be that somebody will send uh, something to the moon, the other always, and the things will just not happen because there is an interference of frequencies. Another area of law not covered by the existing treaties is that of intellectual property. This is particularly relevant to the International Space Station, where at the moment developments in research are covered by the law of each participating country. Only European countries are covered by a common law on intellectual property in space. The Space Station, the, the treaty, the Interna International Government Agreement, also provides that for certain aspects the nationality will play a role. Meaning if the American moves from the American part to the European part, it's few, a few meters, eh? the law will change. And you see that this is, of course, a very complex and this really shows the need that we should uh, invent other concepts for ruling uh, those things in outer space. Finally, let's not forget the question of space debris. After 50 years of space exploration, there's lots of stuff of every size and shape floating in orbit around the Earth, from sections of launchers to satellites that have become inactive. There are no existing laws that cover this type of pollution at the moment, and if there were, who would enforce them? When the Space Treaty was uh, drafted, all uh, activities were governmental activities. Today, most of the activities are private activities. All telecommunications are almost private today. The launchers are private, Ariane Spas, StarSem, Sea Launch, are private organizations. And therefore, the Space Treaty is not matching anymore the reality. And there would be a need to review the Space Treaty.